If only I could find a daddy who wants me just the way I am. When Landon moved from the city and bought a rural ranch, he never imagined it would be the key to finding love. All he wanted was a place where kinksters could vacation without judgment from the outside world. What he got was a whole lot different, and a whole lot more. When yet another rich guy from Denver bought the ranch, Russell just wanted to work with the horses and stay out of sight so he could outlast the latest in a long line of city slickers. When he first sets eyes on his hunky new boss, staying hidden is that last thing on his mind. Has he finally found someone who can love a little who is anything but small? A gay, M slash M cowboy romance with age gap, age play, boss slash employee, and opposites attract. Hot and steamy with plenty of heart and a guaranteed HEA. Landon. A guest ranch in Wyoming. What the fuck am I going to do with this place? It's huge and in terrible shape, but I can see all the things I could do with it. When I saw this place was for sale, I told my realtor to make a lowball offer, thinking they'd never say yes. Apparently, the owners were broke and needed to sell the place fast to hold off bankruptcy, so here I am in the middle of Wyoming with 2,000 acres and a dude ranch on my hands. What was I thinking? The current owners wanted out. I got everything from the furniture to the horses, and even the hot cowboy who runs the equine parts of the business. Walking into the lodge, I can't believe what a fool I was to buy the place. I don't think it's been deep cleaned in years. Maybe I imagine the place looked better in the pictures. I pull my phone out to look at the listing on Zillow. I decide the photos were from the last time the place sold. Well Landon, this is what you get when you rush in and buy a property site unseen. At least the place is structurally sound. I won't need to spend a fortune on the building. The furniture I was so excited about not having to replace is all trash. I pull out my phone and start making notes. If the furniture looks this bad, what will the horses and tack be like? Fuck, I'm going to have to buy a barn full of horses and all the tack before we open. I won't even have time to get used items. Maybe I can lease the horses and tack. I finish looking around the lodge and count everything I have to buy, at least for this room. When I see the basement, I breathe a sigh of relief. I know exactly what I want to do with this space. It's huge, easily the same size as the lodge, with two areas. There are two sets of stairs entering from opposite ends of the place. You don't have to go through one room to get to the other. It'll be the perfect space to turn into a typical dungeon on one side and Little's playroom on the other. Having been around the guys at work and their Little's for the past year, I've learned that Little's and pets get shafted at events. Having a space that can not only tolerate Littles but cater to them will make my guest ranch the perfect place for Littles and caretakers. When I can't bear to look at all I need to do in the lodge for one more minute, I head out to the barn. If the lodge is this bad, I want to see if I can use the horses or the tack. Hopefully, some of it will be salvageable. Having ridden saddlebreds since I was a kid and owning three now, I'm quite the horse snob. Worst case, I could turn the barn into a pony play area and move on with my life. I won't do that. I want my ranch to reach a wider audience than kinky folks. Relief floods through me when I find the horses are well cared for. Hell, their feet even look good. It's surprising the horse manager was taking care of their feet because the last owners owed him a fortune on back pay. There's no way they were paying a farrier and not paying the guy who actually fed the animals. Low lives. Russell, are you out here? I ask, petting a large gray gelding who's poking his head out of a stall. Well, aren't you handsome? I say, stroking the horse's mane, still looking for the hired guy. When the cowboy steps out of the tack room carrying a saddle, I keep my cock from stiffening by sheer force of will. He's perfect. Tall, built, and although his dark hair is graying around the temples, he can't be over 35. He's got a little extra weight around the middle and he's hairy, but the way he swaggers tells me he knows how to move his hips. I want to climb him like a tree. I keep myself from making the first, second, and third lewd comment that comes to mind. I settle for are you Russell? Yes, sir, you must be the new owner, he says, holding the western saddle in one hand while he shakes my hand. 
the saddle must weigh 60 pounds and he's not even straining. I can't help but wonder how this man would feel if he was manhandling me the way he's handling the saddle. God, I need to get laid. Well, I looked over the lodge and it needs work. I wanted to see if the horses were a lost cause, like the furniture. The horses are good. The last owners might not have had much money, but I bought the stock at auction in the fall and worked with them all winter, so they'd be ready for the season. They're a little younger than I'd like for this type of work, but they're willing learners and in excellent shape. Well, now I stepped in it. I wasn't trying to insult the horses. He's clearly attached to them and if I have any hope of him sticking around, I need to remember not to disparage the horses. Good to know. At some point, I'll have to tell him I'm not a total city slicker and know about horses. Today isn't that day, so I play dumb and nod with the hunky guy who's still holding that saddle as if it weighs as much as a can of coke. I didn't mean to interrupt your day. I have to go back to Denver, and I wanted to make a list of things that need to be done in the lodge this week. Can I walk you through the place? Yes, sir, Russ says, face stern and hard as he sets the saddle on the rack and patting the horse on the neck before walking out of the barn towards the lodge. Well, Russ isn't winning any congeniality contests, that's for sure. I'll have a roll-off delivered tomorrow. Can you get all the beds out and all the furniture I've marked with post-it notes out to the dumpster? Do you know anyone who can do some day labor? I'll be back day after tomorrow, but I'd rather not be moving furniture. I'm on the wrong side of 30 for that kind of work, I say, turning toward Russ, trying to keep my libido from kicking into overdrive as he walks to one piece of furniture and lifts it with ease. I'll be able to get most of it myself and I've got a cousin who can help. Russ says, still poking and prodding at the furniture. God, his ass in those jeans. Must not molest the help. Must not molest the help, I chant silently as he moves around lifting furniture with no more effort than he did with the saddle. I'll be back day after tomorrow, I say, walking upstairs to grab my bag. How I long to slip into the shower and touch my aching cock after watching Russ manhandle my furniture. Fuck, I need to get back to Denver so I can line everything up for the summer. It's almost April and if I want to make any money this year, I have to be open by end of May. Russell. When the bells told me who they sold the place to, I looked up the new owner. Who wouldn't look up their new boss? Maybe he's the least photogenic man on earth, because I failed to notice how hot he was. I did, however, notice he was a literal billionaire, but also that he was gay and kinky. He owns a kink club, The Phoenix, with his business partners from his software company Crash. Being kinky and a little makes finding even causal partners hard in rural Wyoming. I do fine on the apps, but they always want me to top. I enjoy topping, but I prefer to bottom. Throw in being a little or wanting someone to tie me up or do other kinky things to me and finding a causal partner gets a lot harder. It wasn't like I missed Landon tending his pants today when I was holding the saddle or when I was checking to see how heavy the furniture was. You can't miss that. It's depressing though, to know someone is hot and kinky and see them getting so turned on by my strength. I could probably enjoy fucking Landon. I don't want to try to dom him. Why else would he be so thrilled to see how strong I am? Sure I can fuck a guy up against the wall like a champ, but I'd rather be the one getting pounded into the drywall. Doing my best to put those thoughts out of my mind, I carry the furniture toward the door. Tomorrow when the roll-off gets here, I'll get it outside. For today, just having it in the main room is enough. I love my job. I get to ride horses every day. When we have people who want to hike or shoot, I get to do those things too. Hell, I've gotten to lead snowmobile and ATV trips. No matter how good my job is, the idea of moving to a place where I can meet a daddy is appealing. Maybe after Landon gives up on making this place viable, I'll move into Denver and train horses. I could always go back to breaking colts or training jumpers, but that's so much more stressful than working here. It takes the whole day to get all the furniture out of the lodge and into the roll-off, but finally I have the place empty. I can't do anything more than feed and water the horses and fall into bed. I work hard all day every day, but there's a difference in working horses and moving furniture. 
At least all the furniture was going down the stairs and not up them. When I wake up and check my phone, I'm not surprised. Naively I thought I'd go back to working with the horses after the furniture was out. Nope. I woke up to a list of chores Landon once done ASAP. Now I'm cleaning the place from top to bottom. While the bells owned the place, I was never in the rooms. I didn't realize how nasty they let the place get after Martha the housekeeper left, but it's clear the bells weren't cleaning well enough. It's hard not to think of one of those Food Network shows about failing restaurants as I clean. I can just picture John Taffer from Bar Rescue yelling shut it down while I clean a bathroom. Thinking about that, I wonder how bad the kitchen is. I'll take a look next time I go downstairs. It wasn't on my list, but it'll have to be done at some point. Landon arrives around 2 in the afternoon. I'm up to my ears in dust and filth, not exactly looking my best. Landon changes clothes and jumps in cleaning. I'm shocked. I've worked here with four different owners. Landon is by far the wealthiest, and he's helped more in one day than the last owners did the whole time they owned the place. The cooks were great people, but they were old and didn't do much around the place as far as helping with actual work. They had built a good staff and didn't need to do much physical labor. All the other owners should have been doing actual work, but weren't. What the fuck am I going to do with Mr. Hottie in ratty jeans bent over scrubbing the floor? Fuck, how am I going to keep my dick from being hard all day? Let's go into town and I'll buy you dinner? Landon says after we've cleaned all afternoon. He's standing and stretching, his belly showing from under his shirt as he puts his arms over his head. He's arching his back into an almost back bend like pose. Do you do yoga? I ask, unable to stop myself as I watch his live body bend and twist. Every morning since I was 12. Why? One of the other owners had a sunrise yoga class in the field over by the lake. It was well attended, and people loved it. The bell stopped the classes because they couldn't teach and didn't have the money to hire instructors. I think you should bring back some of the classes when you open back up. I can sit down and make a list of which classes attracted the most students, I say, wanting so badly to be useful to my new boss. Sure, I want to keep my job, but I also want him to like me. What is going on with me, trying to gain favor with this guy? Shit, I'm a mess. That's a great idea. I had my teaching certificate in college. When I no longer needed it to make ends meet, I let it lapse, but I could take a certification class easily. Do you have any other ideas? You want to hear what the help has to say? I ask, eyebrows shooting up. I've been here through four owners. Only the last two lost money. You'd think they'd care what the people who were here when the lazy Jay was making money think. But they had their own opinions. No one wanted to hear from the horse guy. It didn't matter I have a college degree in farm management. Hell, the bells didn't even listen to me when it was something to do with the horses. Yeah, of course I want to hear what you have to say. I'm not promising to do everything you suggest, but I'll listen. My vision is more niche, so I'm not sure how your plans will fit. But you've been here for years and have a better idea of what works and doesn't. I bought the place on a whim because my day job was stifling me, Landon says, sitting on one of the remaining couches in the entryway with more force than the poor sofa would like. Can we talk about this after a nice shower and preferably over food? I feel gross. Absolutely, let's reconvene in 30 minutes and we'll head into town, Landon says, standing and heading out of the room. Landon. How am I going to keep my hands to myself with this sexy cowboy? I've been dying to touch him all day. I'd love to wear a suit to dinner, but I'm sure Russ won't wear anything that nice and I don't want to make him uncomfortable. There's also no telling what the food situation will be in town. I can't picture Rock River having anywhere you could wear a suit. I go with Wranglers, a western button-down, boots, and cowboy belt buckle. It's my standard horse show outfit. When I walk into the sitting area of the lodge, the look on Russell's face tells me he was expecting me to look like a city slicker. What? You thought I bought a guest ranch and didn't know how to dress the part? I ask, doing a little turn and tugging at my cuffs with a flourish, being silly about it as I walk toward him. 
Well, your boots are new, that's a tell. Russ says, mouth hanging slightly open as he watches me approach. The look on his face hints that maybe the attraction between us isn't a one-way street. I own three horses in Denver and have been riding since I was a kid. So no, my boots are new, I say, smiling, then opening the door and walking to my Subaru. You own a Subaru, Russ says, following me and getting in the passenger side. Well, yes, this is my oldest and cheapest vehicle. It's also the best on gas while still being all the drive. I wanted something here that wouldn't cost me a fortune to drive to town all the time. Also, my friends are driving my truck up this weekend with some stuff from Denver. I'll have to adjust my opinion of you, Russ says, looking down at his feet as he speaks. He seems almost bashful. I pegged him as a dom, but maybe I'm wrong. Curiouser and curiouser. Well, before you do that, wait until you see my horse. He'll be out here next week. What would your horse have to do with my opinion? Well, maximum volume is my retired show horse. He's every bit the prince he always was. All sass and fire even at 19, I say, wondering how this big butch cowboy is going to see my baby. I'm confused. Russ says, eyes tight as he tries to figure out a joke he's not in on. He's a saddlebred. He'll freak out and panic over everything. This is a horse who won't walk out of his stall even at 19 years old. He's still just as likely to jump out or come out on his hind feet. He'll huff and puff and act every bit the prima donna you would expect a rich gay man to own. I show dressage. I mean, I have end, but I was on the national circuit as a youth for dressage. Let's not talk about looking gay on a horse, Russ whispers, looking the picture of ashamed until I catch a glint of humor in his eyes. Don't we make a pair? I have to remind myself again what a bad idea it would be to sleep with the help before we even open. But I think he's taunting me with the way he's grinning at me. I can't help but wonder if he still has his britches from his dressage showing days. God, if this man looks this good in Wranglers, what would he look like in britches? My cock twitches at the thought. Where we end up for dinner is pretty much what I'd imagined, but the food is good. What's even more surprising is how smart Russ is. All his suggestions about the lazy J are things that could make us money. I was thinking of putting in a swimming pool, but when I thought about the way it would change the look of the meadow, I wrote it off. Russ mentions a natural swimming pool and busts out his phone to show me pictures, and I'm sold. Who knew you could have a swimming pool that was clean and safe and not a blight on the landscape? Russ even has suggestions about food at the ranch. I never thought of offering camp cooking classes. But he insists it's a way to keep guests entertained. And he's right, people would love eating food cooked over an open fire out under the stars. Best of all, it wouldn't take a separate staff member to run. Especially when it comes to my kink events, I need things that won't require more staff. I'm going to have a hard time finding people who are okay with the kink and the fewer I need to employ, the better. When I bought the place, I figured I'd have to subsidize my hobby business for a while, if not forever. My goal is to offer events that don't require hiring separate staff. That will not only help make guests happy, but be more profitable. Who knew the sexy cowboy would be so smart? I worry about when Russ finds out about my plans to make the Flying J a kinky getaway. He knows I'm gay. But there's a world of difference between being gay and kinky. The ranch I'm planning is the kind of place where doms can have their subs sit on the floor during dinner. Where you can take your little on a horseback ride. Plenty of caregivers and their littles would love the chance to be little while doing things they wouldn't be able to do anywhere else. I'm afraid Russ won't take well to learning the truth of what I'm building. Over the next few days, we clean out the basement. Seeing the space free of all the boxes and clutter is shocking. It's bigger than I thought. It's going to make an amazing playroom with plenty of space for both littles and more traditional kink. Hey, I need the basement primed. Do you think you can get to that today? Someone is coming day after tomorrow to paint a mural for half of the basement, I say, knowing I'm going to have to fess up soon. If I don't want Russ to figure it out on his own. No one would put a nursery in the basement. 
The moment he sees the plans for the mural, he's going to know something's up. Russell. When Landon told me they were going to paint a mural in the basement, I wasn't sure what they meant, but when I see what Valkyrie is painting, I'm excited. Landon is having an entire scene with trees and animals painted on the walls. While I know it's for real kids, I can't help but dream about playing in a room like that. Friends are bringing furniture for the lodge this weekend. You're normally off other than feeding the horses, but can you help us unload the truck? Landon asks, looking shy. Him acting shy about whatever they're bringing makes me curious. Of course. What time are they going to be here? I'll need to feed the horses before we get started. They won't be here before 10. And they'll want the full tour before they do anything helpful. I'll be lucky if they don't want to take a horseback ride before we unload the truck. Should I have horses ready for them to ride? I ask. Fuck no, they are here to work, not take a vacation. If I've been too busy to go riding and see the property, the least they can do is unload the truck before they go play. Also, they run on gay time, so while they are supposed to be here no later than 10, they could show up after noon. I may have to bribe them. I won't have anything to bribe them with if I let them ride first. My friend Malcolm and his boyfriend are coming, and his boyfriend is quite the fan of horses, Landon says, eyes shining with glee at the idea of bribing his friends. Landon. The basement looks amazing. Valkyrie did a mind-blowing job on painting the place. They painted the playrooms for Malcolm, Sean, and Soren, but seeing the way they took my random ideas and turned them into images is unreal. When the furniture gets here, it'll look finished. The playroom is the last room I should be worried about, but I kept thinking if you build it they will come. To play. I've been putting off telling Russ what kind of guest ranch we're going to be. After my friends show up with adult-sized cribs and high chairs, he's going to know. I'm making it worse by lying but I don't want to lose the person who's taking care of the horses. I have to admit, it's more than that. Russ has great ideas, he's a good worker, and I like his company. When I look over the books, it looks like most of the positive cash flow was coming from the horses. It seems like Russ was buying horses in the fall and starting them. He was working them all winter and selling them at a profit in the spring. It was well over half the income for the ranch last year. I'll never be able to find someone who will do that kind of work for what I'm paying him. I should have talked to him about all of this before. As I hear my friends pulling into the driveway, I know it's too late to change how I handled this now. I put on my best smile and open the door. Russell. Today is the big day. I've met most of Landon's friends, but today he's having his grand opening for the Rocking Horse Ranch. When Landon told me he was changing the name from the Lazy J, I thought he was crazy. There were a lot of good reviews online. There were even people who came back every couple of years, but I love the new name, and it makes sense to give the place a new name for the new life it's going to have now. And there is something about Rocking Horse Ranch that says Little's welcome here that the Lazy J didn't have. When I met Landon, I thought he was like all the other owners who've ignored me and run the ranch terribly. He's the best kind of surprise. He's not only the man I'm falling in love with, but he's smart enough to ask for help when he needs it. I want this opening to be amazing for Landon and the ranch. The place will be full with not only his friends, but Daddy even invited a few kink bloggers and educators to come and see the place. One thing Daddy wanted to have at the ranch was education and not just a fun place to play. Daddy and I are going to do a demo on single tail whips tonight. I'm not a dom or daddy, but I'm very skilled with a whip, so I'll be whipping the new employee, Travis. When Travis started working here, we hit it off immediately. I'm not sure what happened with his ex, but he needed a friend he could be little with. Daddy and I could have done lots of things as a demo that wouldn't have involved Travis, so I think Daddy has something in mind. Maybe he wants to set Travis up with someone he knows. I've never had a daddy who was as good to me as Landon is. I used to say Dylan was my daddy. He never took care of me the way he should have, even though I called him my daddy for years. Landon is a person who enjoys taking care of people. I used to be so worried he saw me as just another person to take care of because I needed it. 
Now I know he's absolutely the guy who take care of someone because they needed it, but that doesn't change when he takes care of me. I'm special. He tells me that all the time. I often wonder how a sex toy mishap turned out to be the best thing that ever happened to me. I'd never have told him I was little or played with him. I probably would have stayed here and played with people now and then, but I'd never have played with him. Watching everyone gathered in the dungeon for my demo, I can't help but smile as Daddy wraps his arms around me. Daddy kisses my forehead before he hops up on the stage to introduce Travis and me. Landon. What was I thinking having my sweet boy do a single tail demo on Travis? When Travis started working here, he and Russ bonded immediately. I've seen Russ be good with Jamie, Hendrix, but they all have daddies, so how they interact is different. When Travis started working here, I saw a whole new side of Russ. He's so protective of Travis. I'm not sure what happened before Travis got here, but Russ has decided Travis is his little brother. Travis is a masochist and while my sweet boy isn't a sadist, he takes care of Travis's need to be hurt now and then. Mostly they play like little boys, but once in a while they will play harder. It took a lot of conversations between Russ and myself before I understood what was going on, but now I see it for what it is. A stopgap for Travis until he can find someone he can trust. While it wasn't easy to have those conversations about what was going on with Russ and me, and Russ and Travis, it showed me I want Russ in my life long term. I paused to make an announcement. Travis knows what I'm going to say. I wanted to make sure he was okay if he didn't end up getting a scene, but no one else knows what I'm doing. I didn't want to risk Russ finding out from someone else. Hoping up on stage, I grabbed the microphone to introduce the demo. I'd like to introduce the other owner here at Rocking Horse Ranch, Russell, who's going to be doing a single tail demo for you tonight with our lovely employee Travis, who does a bit of everything around here. Please give a warm welcome to Russ and Travis. Russ is looking at me with wide eyes. He's not moving, and I have a moment of panic before he takes off running, damn near tackling me and wrapping me in a bear hug. Why'd you do that? I can't pay enough to replace the front door much less part of the ranch. You are a great asset to me and the ranch. You deserve to have a stake in what you're making so much better with your presence and ideas. I love you, and I want you to have a place here with me for as long as you want. The room isn't as loud as I thought it would be. I take an embarrassingly long time to notice the mic caught everything. The entire room heard my declaration of love. I love you too. I think you're crazy for giving me part of the ranch, but I love you so much. At Russ's statement, the room explodes into cheers and wolf whistles and catcalls. I didn't intend to tell everyone how much I love this man, but now I've told my found family how much this man means to me, I can't believe it took me this long to tell them. I can't wait for the next chapter in our lives to begin. We're booked for most of the spots for the Littles events. The puppy and kitten events are completely booked. I may offer more kink events just to meet the demand, but none of that matters half as much as the man standing next to me. Who knew buying this place would be the best thing to ever happen to me? I give Russ a kiss and while it starts out chaste, it soon turns more frantic. That we can't run up to our room for a little alone time now seems like the worst idea ever. Maybe I should have told him in private so we could enjoy this moment. Travis makes his way to us and pulls Russ into a bone-crushing hug and my friends make their way to me. I know this is how it should have been done. Not only was this about our love, but about Russ's value here and he deserves to have people celebrate him. Russell. I'm stunned and overwhelmed and for the first time in my life I can fully admit to myself how much I love someone. I'm head over heels for Landon for a million reasons. Him giving me a partial stake in his ranch means nothing to me, not the money anyway. It's the pledge of his affection that means the world to me. I want to get through this demo, then sit with the man who's my lover, my daddy, and my best friend. We have so much to look forward to, not the least of which is what I'm going to do to him in our bedroom later tonight. Russell. Landon, get your ass out here before it gets any hotter. I have visions of using this furniture today, Malcolm yells from the yard as Jamie runs in, hugging me on his way by. I have to pee, he says bouncing up and down like he's going to burst. 
I point him towards the bathroom, laughing as he runs off. Malcolm, did you make your sweet boy hold it all the way here? Soren asks, making his way to the coffee set up in the front room. Do I tell you how to manage your boy? No, I don't. Let's get this done. My boy will mutiny if he doesn't get to go horseback riding today. You don't know how much he's been pestering me about riding a pony since he found out you bought the place, Malcolm says, sticking his hand out for me to shake. Hi, I'm Russ, I say, as everyone shakes my hand. When I looked Landon up, I saw he was kinky. When I see Hendrix and Jamie, I can't help thinking they might be littles. Thinking about how the mural starts higher on the wall, it clicks. They're building a playroom for littles here at the ranch. All these men are daddies here with their littles and I'm going to end up made fun of again for being a little and not a twink. I'm so over being made to feel stupid for being a little and not fitting the part, I can't even focus on the idea of this place being a getaway spot for kinksters. There is a crib, changing table, high chair, and enough IKEA shelves to choke a horse. Not to mention there are those squishy floor pads and boxes of toys, blocks, and everything you would need for a little's play space. Seeing everything in the trailer, it makes sense. Furniture companies delivered all the furniture for the rest of the lodge. Landon said this stuff had to be special ordered and brought up by his friends. I thought it was going to be weird kid stuff with lots of bears and moose. It's all for age players, not actual kids. Somehow, I keep myself from squealing with excitement. When Landon told me his friends were coming up with their partners to bring furniture, I never dreamed they'd be helping. I thought it would be me and maybe Landon unloading everything. But they jump in and get shit done. It turns out Jamie was running his father's bar by the time he was a teenager, so he's no stranger to hard work. Hendrix also shocked me when he told me he's in the Air Force. We have everything down in the basement in no time. Russ, I know it's your day off, but would you mind taking us on a ride this afternoon? We're going to work down here for a little while. I want to get everything set up first. How does two sound? Landon asks, looking like he wants me as far away from this room and his friends as possible. Great, this is going to be awkward. Since I'm taking the owner out for a ride, I should only pull the best behaved horses. There are a couple of horses I want to check out, and Landon claims he knows how to ride. He bragged about showing. That doesn't mean he can stick on a horse that doesn't literally take its cues off the announcer in a show ring. I'd rather there be an issue when it's the owner than a guest. Maybe I'm a little curious to find out if he's a real horseman. When I'm done saddling the horses and we're ready to go, I make my way to the lodge to get everyone. Their voices are coming from the basement, so I head down there, assuming I'll find them setting up shelves or putting out the toys. What I see makes me cry. Jamie and Hendrix are both dressed in jeans, but now they have on shirts that say Daddy's Cowboy in silver glitter with a rocking horse ranch logo at the bottom. My jaw clenches in anger when I see these socially acceptable little boys with their stupid shirts. Why can't I have a daddy who'd love me enough to give me a shirt like that? I've always wanted to have a daddy who wouldn't mind me wearing things that were super masculine. My anger is quickly being replaced with frustration and sadness. If I'm not careful I'm going to start crying. It's been so long since I was little for more than jacking off and even longer since I had someone to take care of me. Before I can start to cry, I turn to leave but, in my haste to turn around I trip over my enormous feet and end up falling to my knees, my kneecap slamming against the sharp front of the step. It makes everything worse. I can hear feet rushing on the floor above me. I can't figure out why people are running until I notice I'm yelling. I sound like a cat in heat. Fuck. When I try to get to my feet, Landon is there to help me stand. I'm not one to cry over getting hurt. Not since I was an actual child, but here surrounded by everything I've ever wanted, my emotions are too close to the surface. I can't help but cry when Landon puts his arms around me, hugging me tightly. Shit, Russ, do you think you broke your leg? I'm sure there's a set of crutches around here somewhere. The ranch has hiking and horseback riding, for Christ's sake. Tell me where they are. The barn? We'll get you up the stairs or I can call 911, Landon babbles, 
worried about me and not the work comp suit I could be about to file. It's not broken, it just hurts, I say, doing my best to get my tears under control. Then Hendrix is behind me with a chair, and I see that stupid shirt and the tears start again. Why couldn't they have been into puppy or pony play? Anything but littles with their stupid shirts and their stupid perfect playroom and their socially acceptable bodies for age play. I'm ruining their day. I get my tears to stop, but I can't stop staring at their shirts. These guys must think I'm a total loser with the way I'm crying. Fuck, I literally can't remember the last time I cried and here I am bawling like a baby. I'm okay, and if we're going to ride, we should head out or we'll get caught out after dark, I say, standing silently, thrilled when my knee holds my weight. My knee hit the stair right across the kneecap and it really hurts. Maybe I shouldn't have been so quick to say I was okay. I feel like there might be a trip to urgent care in my future if my knee isn't remarkably better tomorrow. If I hadn't made a scene already I'd bow out of the ride but can't figure out how to say never mind I'm hurt now so I trudge down up the stairs. We can ride tomorrow or another day. I don't want you to hurt yourself trying to take us out. We can ride here in the field around the lodge, Landon says, shoulders damn near at his ears. Either way, I'd have to go out to the barn and unsaddle the horses, I say, unsure of what they want me to do. I know how to saddle and unsaddle a horse. I can take care of the horses if you aren't up to it. I'll have everything in the wrong place, and you'll have to reorganize the tack room, I'm sure. But I'm more than capable. You are one of those type A people. I bet what they eat is on a list in the feed room. You don't even have to worry about them getting the wrong thing, Landon says, as sassy and bitchy as I've seen him get. His head tilts as he looks down his nose at me like I'm being ridiculous. No, I'll be fine. I say, heading upstairs first so they can't see the way I'm wincing as I make my way out to the barn. I can hear them following along behind me. Landon. Well, at least I didn't have a heart attack. Jesus, I thought he was dying there for a minute, the way he was sobbing. I thought he'd broken something. I'm not discounting his knee hurt, but he seemed far more upset about Jamie and Hendrix being little than the physical injury. It took me a moment to realize his emotional reaction was not shock at having the room set up for littles. How did I not notice Russ is a little? I should have figured it out. When I think back over every conversation, I can't put my finger on anything I missed. Hindsight is 2020, but there really wasn't anything he did or said that makes me go aha I should have known he was a little. I guess I can stop worrying about him quitting because of what's going to happen in my basement. Although I'm going to have to make sure my guests understand they can't be hitting on my staff unless the staff starts the flirting. If you were to let on he's a little boy, some guest is going to snap him up and take him home with them. I've been working hard not to hit on him. What are my customers going to do when they see this sweet boy looking so good in his Wranglers? Maybe I should get him a shirt of his own. I bought a ton of them, and he'd be so cute. By the time we get to the barn, I've got my head out of the gutter. Everyone is looking at his ass. I bet Malcolm and Soren are having the same thoughts as I am, mostly how much fun this boy would be to play with. I know Malcolm and Jamie were talking about getting a little boy to play with them. Russ goes through the safety speech he gives everyone at the ranch. I grab the sugar cubes I stuck in my pocket and give one to Chimichanga, the horse I'm supposed to be riding. I'll give some to Hendrix and Jamie when they aren't paying attention to the safety lesson. Chimichanga is a brat. He's doing his best to bend himself into a pretzel to get another treat. I'll have to teach the jerk to do tricks. If he's this food motivated, he'll be easy to teach. Kids, littles and bigs will get a kick out of a horse who can take a bow and rear on command. If I put some time in with him I might be able to get him to sit or lay down. By the time we're all mounted and heading out on the trail, I have a new respect for Russ. I knew he was good at so many parts of his job, but even with the emotional upheaval he experienced this afternoon, he's good with Jamie and Hendrix. They're testing mine and their daddy's patience, but Russ is great with them. He takes the time to help everyone on their horses. He even makes sure everyone knows how to turn, stop, and ask the horses to go forward before we head out. Being good with customer service is hard, 
but Russ seems great at it. Jamie was little as soon as he started petting the horses. Hendrix, while more subdued, is clearly little as well. Russ takes their attitude and behavior in stride, making sure they're okay and happy and going to manage the ride regardless of what headspace they're in. When I paid him his back pay, it was because it was what he was owed. I also didn't want to bother with hiring someone new. Now it's clear he won't be replaceable. Landon, since you weren't listening at all, I assume you know how to do everything I just went over in my safety lesson? Russ asks. I can hear a slight shake in his voice, and I know I've fucked up. He's worried I'm going to treat him differently, or he thinks I'm an asshole. I thought he knew me better than that. But I guess your boss finding out you're a little in the most disastrous way possible would shake anyone's confidence. I do, I say, smiling and putting the bridle on without help just to show him I'm not lying. Good, can you ride in the back and make sure everyone stays together? I want to make sure none of the horses decide being an ass is a good idea. It's been a while since they've been out on a group ride, Russ says, looking sheepish. He must think I'm going to be mad at him because the horses aren't perfect. We're not even open yet. Sounds good, I say, mounting up. When I watch Russ try to get on, I regret not offering to help him mount. It's clear his knee is bothering him, but offering again for him not to take this ride will only make things worse. Russ was clear he was fine and even if he's not, I don't want to make him think I don't trust his judgment. Chimichanga is spooky, but not bad. It's clear Russ put me on a horse that's a little greener than the rest, but Chimi is fine. I can't stop smiling at the way Jamie and Hendrix are glowing as we get out of the field and onto the trail. It's early spring and cold, but the sun is shining. I'm thrilled to be on a horse and out in the woods. Sadly, you don't trail ride saddlebreds, at least not show horses. Even Max, now that he's retired, isn't a horse you can take out on a trail, so I haven't gotten to do this since I was a teenager. I wish I could talk to Russ on the ride because it's clear this is his element. He's so much more at ease here on a horse than he was any of the other times we've interacted. Sadly, he's right. Someone needs to stay in the back and make sure everything is okay. Having a less skilled rider in the rear probably isn't the best idea. I'll have to take a ride with Russ when it's just the two of us. That thought warms my chest and puts a smile on my face. I'm not surprised I want to spend more time alone with him, I'm just surprised that the desire feels so urgent. When I bought the ranch, I wasn't looking for a partner. Hell, I wasn't intending to buy the ranch until I was buying it, but seeing Russ so strong and confident, I can't help but wish he was my boy. Before I signed papers for the ranch, I watched drone footage, but sitting on a horse and moving through the woods, I can't believe how amazing this place is. Russ is telling us about the plants and pointing out tracks. As we move toward the creek that runs through part of the ranch, I can't wait for summer when we can cross the creek when it's less swollen with spring runoff so we can head farther into the hills. Jamie and Hendrix are chatting with their daddies, and I can't help but wishing I had a boy of my own to chat with me like that. Some little boy who will tell me about all the things they see and how excited they are about getting to ride a horsey. How they want to swim in the creek as soon as it's warm enough. Watching Russ as we move along the trail, I wonder if this strong, smart man could be my boy. When we finally make it back to the ranch, I'm starving. It's almost 8 and all I want to do is eat. I can't wait for the ranch to be up and running, so there are people around and we aren't coming back to an empty lodge. Not that I expect people to wait on me. It's just I'm used to being able to grab food on my way home after a long day or order in. We're way too far to get anything delivered or run out and grab something. I'm going to go start dinner, Jamie says, running up to the lodge, followed by the rest at a much more sedate pace. Russ and I unsaddle the horses and put feet in their stalls before we let them in. Somehow, even with everything that happened today, Russ has stayed the calm, powerful man I originally met. When we make it to the lodge, I smell food in my stomach reminds me I haven't eaten since breakfast by growling loudly. What's for dinner? I'm starving, I ask, walking into the dining room. The rest of the group is sitting around chatting and laughing. When I look at Russ, 
All the confidence and happiness he'd had while we were with the horses has disappeared, and he's shuffling around looking like he's about to bolt. I made chicken crack in the instant pot, Jamie says, beaming as he dishes food into bowls for everyone. I sit and chat with Soren about what's going on at work. Russ is still standing and looking at the table like he wants nothing more than to sit and enjoy a meal with us, but he's holding himself back. Sit, have dinner, I say, then enjoy watching him as he walks to the table. He looked great from behind, but when I see his face, he looks like a kicked puppy. Us figuring out he's a little seems to have made him afraid of us. I thought we were becoming friends. Well, as much as a boss and their employee can be friends, but he seems so worried about being here. I don't want to make things worse, but I want him to feel comfortable. Russ being a little makes me desperate to keep him working here. It'd be almost impossible to replace him even if he wasn't a little. Now that I know I have the chance to have a little on staff who knows the ranch and horses, I can't lose him. A few years ago, I stayed at a B&B run by a pony and their handler. The place was so amazing because they understood their clients in ways you couldn't unless you were a pony or a handler. They hosted many kinks, but the setup for ponies was amazing. I want the Rocking Horse Ranch to be that for littles and their caregivers. Sure, I want all types of kinky people to be comfortable here. I want vanilla folks to enjoy spending time here, but I want my kink weekends to be something special for the people who attend. Having a little on staff will only make the place better. If I want Russ to stay, I need him to feel safe. Somehow, I forgot Jamie runs the online Littles group and the Littles events at the Phoenix. Before I know it, Jamie has drawn Russ out of his shell and has him talking. Malcolm may be the CEO at Crash, but he's always been a harder nut to crack than the rest of us. When he found Jamie, a boy not old enough to buy his own beer, I thought the boy would get run over. Jamie shocked me because he was so different from the other boys Malcolm had. He's a natural talker and loves getting to know new people. It seems he's decided Russ needs to be more comfortable because he's doing his best to bring Russ into the conversation. After dinner, everyone goes up to their rooms. I always feel more alone when I've spent a while with my friends who are in couples. That I'm lonely isn't surprising, but the thought that Russ might fill my loneliness is new. In the morning, I cook breakfast for everyone. Russ doesn't appear and I'm not surprised, but I am a little disappointed. What shocks me is when it's time for everyone to go, Russ comes out to say goodbye to Jamie. I can hear Russ promise to text him so they can set up a time to hang out. Russ even agrees to come to the next Lil's Night at the Phoenix. I'm glad he's going to attend a Lil's Nights it's around 3 hours to Denver. I make a note to try and mention he can stay at my place while he's in Denver. It's nice to know he feels comfortable with at least one of my friends. Maybe he won't quit as soon as he can line up a new job. Landon. Fuck my life. What have I done? Somehow, the hot cowboy I was drooling over yesterday let me take care of him when he was hurt. And now he wants me to give him a bath. Oh, sweet baby Jesus, what have I gotten myself into? He called me daddy. Should I ignore it because he was upset and hurt? Would he have called anyone who was kind to him daddy? Or was he so upset it slipped out because that's what he wants? Fuck if I know. What I do know is Russ is going to be the death of me. Russ is moving like an old man. It's clear he's sore, but I think it's more than the toy. Getting dumped from a horse hurts. He probably needs a chiropractor as well. Maybe I should have my personal physician come out tomorrow. It will make Russ crazy, but it's not like I can't afford it. Hell, I flew my horse's chiropractor to Louisville for nationals because my horse was a little off his game. I'm going to grab my truck, I say, turning to get it. When I look at Russ on my way out the door, he looks panicked that I'm leaving. He'll never make the walk to the lodge. It's not close and he could barely make it to the bathroom. Kissing his forehead I say, Daddy will be right back. Russ is standing by the driveway to his cabin when I return with the truck. I have to remind myself no matter how little he is, he's still a cowboy. No matter that I show horses, I luckily missed the macho lesson. I have no need to push through the pain. Idiot that he is, he won't let me help him get in the truck. 
My truck is lifted and him getting his foot high enough to get in is clearly hard for him, but he eventually makes it into the cab. Russ all but falls out of the truck when he tries to step out and decides halfway that he shouldn't stretch his legs and jumps. I might be bleeding with how hard I'm biting my tongue trying not to boss him around. Is it bossing him around when it's in his own best interest? If we'd talked about him being my boy, I'd just tell him what to do. When we get to the stairs, I can't keep my mouth shut anymore. I teach him how to go upstairs one at a time. Who knew my summer taking care of my sick grandmother would pay off? I lead him into my room. It's not my fault. The big tub is in the only suite at the ranch, and I've been staying in that room. On my way by, I grab a sheet from the linen cart, spreading it on the bed so he doesn't get sand and dirt on the sheets. When I have the sheet laid out, I help Russ lay on the bed and go look for all the little bath toys I bought. Thanks to Jamie being his bratty self, the bath toys are in a box labeled Mine Don't Touch. And they required a call to Jamie to make sure the toys are really his. If that boy were mine, I'd put him over my knee. With the way Malcolm is laughing and telling him what a naughty boy he is, I think he's going to get a punishment. When I opened the door, I thought Russ had fallen asleep. I'm putting things in the bathroom when I notice he's peeking at me from behind the pillow. It looks like he's crying again. I can't help rushing over to him and petting his hair out of his face, asking him, What's wrong, buddy? I thought you weren't coming back because I was bad. I didn't want to take a bath alone, Russ says, hiding his face. It's heartbreaking that this sweet boy would think I wasn't coming back because I took too long. Maybe he's being more emotional because he's in pain and embarrassed about getting the toy lost, but I can't help but think it's a bigger problem. Rubbing his back so he knows I care about him, I kiss his forehead. I'm going to turn the bath on, but I'll keep talking to you, so you know I'm not leaving you. Does that sound better? I ask, heading into the bathroom keeping up a litany of random conversation, so he knows I'm not going anywhere. On my way, I grab the box from the hall. Do you want to pick out a few toys for your bath tonight? I ask, setting the box on the floor next to the bed so he can see into the box without putting pressure on his bottom. It says, mine. I don't want to use your boy's toys and make them mad, Russ says, looking dejectedly at the box. No, that's Jamie being a brat. He played with them last night when he was here and decided to stake his claim on them. They don't belong to him. I've seen his bathroom at home. Trust me, the little troublemaker has enough toys for an army of little boys. Him claiming these is just his way of being cute, I say, spinning the box so the word mine is facing me. Oh, you don't have a boy to take care of? The way he asks is so hopeful it's cute. How could I have missed how much this boy needs and wants a daddy of his own? No, I don't have a boy of my own to take care of. Maybe you want to be my boy? I ask, knowing it's unfair when he's in his little space and so emotionally vulnerable. The hopeful look in his eyes gives me pause. I have to be careful not to hurt him. The big cowboy is so tender. Really, you would want a boy who looks like a daddy and not a proper little boy? Russ asks tucking his face in the pillow again. Trying to hide how scared he is of being rejected. It must be hard to be a little who looks like a bear. I'll have to get Christopher to come up and visit. Meeting Sean's college football playing little will show him not all littles look like Jamie. But with the way Jamie was taking him under his wing this weekend, I'm sure Jamie will be dragging this little munchkin to every little's event on the Phoenix's calendar. You are a proper little boy. I don't care what you look like. I like your hairy body and your soft tummy, I say, rubbing his belly. I want to make sure he knows I mean what I'm saying. Ote daddy, Russ says, seeming to take it as gospel. I turn the water off and pull the bath toys out for Russ to play. Let daddy help you get in the tub. Do you want daddy to help with your bath? I ask, but as soon as the words are out of my mouth, his head is moving up and down. He looks like a bobble head with how fast he's nodding. I take it you want daddy to give you a tubby? Please, Russ says, leaning on me as he walks. Getting my boy in the tub is a bit of a challenge. Russ seems to push through the pain when he needs to, but it's worrisome he's having so much trouble moving. 
I get the cowboy up mentality but to ride 10 miles back to the barn with the toy lost inside him. And then take care of Jed is a whole new level of strong. I just can't decide if it's also a whole new level of stupid. I get there wasn't much I could have done while he was riding, but at least I would have come and taken care of the horse. Russ seems most excited about the boats. I have to restrain myself from jumping online and ordering a ton in every size and color. He's far too cute as he make them race with the most adorable splishing noises. Sadly, he never puts his weight on his bottom. My poor boy is still hurting even when he's playing. Daddy, eyes dirty, needs help to get queen, Russ says, brandishing the bar of soap at me. Oh, my goodness, does my boy need help getting all clean? Whatever will he do? I guess I can take care of my little munchkin. Let's get him all clean and ready for bed, I say, grabbing a baby washcloth from the box. I work the tear-free soap on the cloth. You don't really need tear-free soap for littles, but that smell can't be found anywhere else. I wash my boy's neck and shoulders, using my thumbs to work on the knots in his neck. When I get to his arms, I start at his fingers and get between them. I can't help but smile when he giggles as I work on the underside of his arms. By the time I get to his armpits, he's wiggling and laughing. Is my boy ticklish? I ask, using my fingers to tickle his sides. As soon as I try to tickle Russ on purpose, he's flailing around and laughing uncontrollably. Oh, my, does my boy have tickle spots? What would you do if Daddy tied you up and tickled you? I don't know, Daddy, but we could see if Daddy wanted to tickle me another day. There's an evil glint in Russ's eyes when he talks about being tickled and I can't wait to have him at my mercy. The desire to tickle him is so strong, I almost can't wait. As I wash my boy's belly, I kiss his cheek, making sure it's loud and exaggerated when I do, and it sets Russ giggling. This boy is so sweet. He's keen to please, but from what I've seen, he's not what anyone would call a doormat. The more I see his little side, the more I want to get to know that part of him. Does my baby boy want daddy to wash his private parts, or do you want to do them yourself? We haven't negotiated at all. Now isn't the time for a full negotiation, but I don't want to violate his consent. I don't even know if he's sexual when he's little. I think he is. He was wearing that onesie and underoos when he lost the toy, but we haven't talked. You wash, daddy, Russ says, wiggling around so I can reach his groin. I get his thigh creases so he doesn't end up with a rash from sweat, but I keep things very clinical. The way you would with an actual child. Okay, buddy, can you move around so your tummy is here, I say, patting the edge of the tub. I need to look at your bottom to make sure it's okay. And your tushy needs to be all clean so you aren't sticky, I say, making my voice upbeat and even reach to tickle his sides as I do. Be gentle please, Russ says, moving how I asked. His face is all business like he's afraid it's going to hurt. How did he end up so pliant even when he's sure it's going to hurt? I can't help but wonder if he had an abusive childhood or maybe an ex. He's just so willing to do anything I ask, no matter the consequences. I run the cloth over his bottom, doing my best to get the lube off with no soap and minimal pressure. I watch his face the whole time to make sure it's not hurting him. All done, sweetheart. Let me help you get ready for bed, I say, standing and grabbing a towel. When I have the towel ready for my boy, I help him stand. I take advantage of his pliant nature and wrap him in the fluffy towel that has a ducky hood. Something expands inside my chest as I realize I haven't really lived until I saw my big, sexy cowboy wearing a ducky towel. I add a towel warmer to my mental list of things to buy for this adorable boy. Something tells me he's never been spoiled the way he deserves. I take my time giving him as many hugs as I can get away with as I dry him off. Jams? Russ asks, as I help him over to the bed. Fuck, I forgot to grab him any clothes before we headed up here. Well, I know how I forgot. The cowboy was standing by the driveway. The word cowboy sounds smarmy even in my own mind. With how upset he got when I took too long getting the bath toys, I know I can't go to the cabin to find PJs. I'll be right back, buddy. 
I'm going to run downstairs and grab something for you to wear, okay? I'll be back so fast. Why don't you count and see how long it takes for me to come back? I ask, running from the room and hoping I can find what I'm looking for quickly. When I decided to start a kink-themed guest ranch, I ordered t-shirts and onesies for littles. They all have some gender variant of daddy's cowboy on them. After the way he looked at Jamie and Hendrix in their shirts, I bet my sweet boy will flip if I give him one to wear to bed. I also grabbed some pain meds for him. I have some of the good Tylenol from Canada in my car. It's not that I want to put him in rocking horse ranch clothing to brand him as mine. No, I wouldn't be like that. Normally I'm not one to put my mark on a sub or little I'm playing with, but with Russ, yeah, I want to mark him as mine. Hell, if I could get away with coming all over him, I would, and the thought of marking him like that makes my cock harden. What the fuck is wrong with me? Walking back into the room, I can see his face all scrunched up in concentration. I can't wait to give this sweet boy a better reason than counting to think so hard. Daddy brought you something to wear for bed, and some medicine to make you feel less ouchy. Can you take the good Tylenol? I ask smiling at him but not showing him what I have for him to wear. I don't want him to see what the shirt says until he gets to see it on himself. Russ nods so I give him two pills and let him take it with a bottle of water before I put on his shirt. Okay daddy, Russ says, wiggling around on the bed. The moment he puts his weight on his bottom, he whimpers and rolls over. Poor boy is still so sore. Hopefully the meds will kick in quickly. I scrunch the shirt up so it's easy to put on. Then I pop it over his head, trying to make it as quick as possible. Okay buddy, do you want to see? I ask, pulling out my phone and snapping a picture. You look so cute, little man, I say, showing him the phone. How could I have been so wrong yesterday? When he got so upset about the shirts, I just assumed it was jealousy, but his eyes are welling up with tears. My sweet boy rolls over so his back is to me and it's clear I missed something. He's devastated and I don't know why. Russell. Somehow, knowing Landon and his friends are all daddies makes it harder to keep from fantasizing about him as I lay in bed. Landon is attractive, sure, but knowing he's a daddy makes him so much hotter. While we were at dinner, Jamie told me all about the Littles group he runs online and how I should come to the Littles events at the Phoenix. For the first time in a long time, I want to do something like a little event. Sure, I play now and then, but normally it's alone. When I was back in Texas I was with Dylan, but being around all these littles makes me want to be little so badly. Before I get in bed, I pull out the box under my bed with my little items and my collection of sex toys. I pull out my onesie and my largest dildo before I get dressed and lie in bed. Leaving the button on my onesie unbuttoned so I can use my dildo, I lube up my hole and I can't stop thinking about the way Landon rubbed my back while I was crying after I fell. He wasn't trying to be sexual. Hell. I don't even know if he's interested in me. But that doesn't stop me from thinking about Landon rubbing my back as I work the dildo into my hole. It's been so long since anyone's fucked me, the dildo is tight, but I want to take this enormous dildo for some reason. Working the tip in and out, I relax, and it reminds me why I love being fucked. The burn is so intense. The way it's stretching me open has me gasping as I push it deeper. When I have the toy about halfway in, I rub my nipples through my onesie. The cloth sliding over my sensitive nipples has me moaning and pushing back onto the toy. Forcing the toy deeper in my ass makes me want my pacey. I need the comfort as I push the toy in farther. It's been so long since I've allowed myself to suck on my pacey at all. Let alone while I'm jacking off. Having my pacey in my mouth pushes my excitement higher, allowing my hole to relax enough to press the toy home. I work the toy in and out, hitting that bundle of nerves on every stroke until my cock is leaking and I haven't even touched it yet. My ex, Dylan, had me trained to only come with anal stimulation. Even though I normally don't masturbate like this, I wanted to be filled tonight. Thinking of Landon using my hole for his pleasure has me coming faster than I have in years. I get up and make my way to the bathroom to clean up. When I pull the toy free of my hole, I feel so empty and lost I decide to sleep with a plug-in. 
I get myself ready for bed, deciding to wear a onesie but swapping it out for a clean one. Before putting my plug in I grab a pair of underoos that are thick and padded so I can enjoy not only the plug but the padding. When I wake up in the morning, I pull the plug out and get ready for my day, but being empty has me feeling unsettled. I need the comfort of having something in me, so I put my plug back in, deciding for both a onesie and another pair of padded underoos. Feeding the horses with my plug in and the onesie on has me feeling little. After saying my goodbyes to Jamie and everyone else, I decide to take a ride to calm me. Thinking about the freedom of riding combined with the plug pressing into me in rhythm with Jed's smooth, slow rack stride has me so turned on. Jed's a little spooky, but he's generally a good boy so I decide to risk it. As we head out on the trail, I'm thankful I brought my backpack because the toy is making it hard to concentrate. It feels so good, but I might have to take it out. I leave the toy in as I continue farther. There is a plastic bag on the trail, and it blows across my path. Before I have time to wonder how the fuck a bag ended up here, Jed spins and I don't spin with him. Leading me to plop down in the trail on my ass. I'm sure I look like the roadrunner for just a moment before gravity kicks in and I go boom. I don't have too much time to worry about how stupid I look with the way the toy presses up inside me and I know I've made a terrible life decision. Jed, to his credit, doesn't go anywhere, thank God, because the idea of chasing him down would have been too much. How do you explain to your boss why you need him to go find the horse you were riding because you left your butt plug in? Grabbing Jed's reins, I lean into his shoulder. Using him for balance while I wriggle my pants down so I can pull the plug out. When my fingers run over my empty crack, there's a moment when I wonder how I came out when I pulled my pants off. Then I realize it didn't fall out. It fell in, so to speak. I shove my fingers in, praying I can get it out, but standing up with my pants around my knees isn't the best way to relax and get it out. Fuck my life. It had. A. Base. How did it get lost? Feeling the tears of anger and frustration running down my face, I keep myself calm enough not to scream. The idea of having to go to the hospital for this on top of me not having health insurance has me crying for a whole new set of reasons. I've been sexually active and kinky since I was 19 and I've never had to go to the hospital for a sex injury. I was planning to keep that streak alive. But here I am sobbing in the woods at least 10 miles from the lodge with a sex toy lost in my ass, and a horse who isn't the most stable. The idea of getting back on Jed makes my sphincter pucker, a circumstance I need like another asshole. Gee, interesting it took a circumstance like this to introduce me to my inner stand-up comedian. Yeah, I'm standing up for a reason. I try walking and it's clear that's not going to work either. When I come to a large rock, I decide this is going to be my best bet to swing back on Jed. Somehow, I get myself back on him and, to his credit, he's being a good boy. The thought that if he'd been a good boy earlier, I wouldn't have a sex toy stuck up my ass doesn't pass me by as we head home. Every step has the toy pressing into me more. The toy rubbing on my prostate felt amazing at the beginning of the ride. It's gone from torturously good to just plain torture. By the time I get back to the barn, it feels like my insides are raw. I've been crying for the past few miles. Pulling off his tack, shoving it in the tack room, and letting him out is all I can handle. I rush to my cabin to get the toy out. Digging out my poppers from my toy box before I lay down. The poppers are probably outdated but I'm going to need them if I have any hopes of relaxing enough to get this toy out without ripping myself open. When I'm as comfortable as I can get, I work my fingers into my abused ass trying to get the toy out. I can feel the toy, but I can't get my fingers hooked around it so I can pull it out. The next time I look at the clock, it's been two hours and, although my poor anus feels like hamburger, I'm no closer to getting the toy out. I'm going to have to go to the hospital and have some doctor deal with this. The idea of the one hour drive half of which is on dirt roads has me sobbing. I struggle with myself for a long time, but finally, weary and desperate, I decide to ask Landon for help. I'll quit the moment he drops me at the ER door and will just leave my belongings. I'll never have to see him again. Rust to Landon, I fell off Jed on my ride and I need a lift to the ER in Fort Collins. Can you take me? My phone pings almost as soon as I set it down. 
Having to answer questions about why I need the hospital farther away than the closest one has me crying harder. Landon to Russ, I'm on my way out to the cabin. What's wrong? I saw you come back a while ago. Did you break something? Why didn't you call me while you were writing or when you got back? How the fuck did this man text that much that fast while walking? Pounding my head on the pillow, I debate if I should tell him what's going on or if I can come up with a lie before he gets here. The answer to if I can come up with a lie is, no I couldn't. I exhausted all options before I swung off Jed when I returned to the barn. My door is opening and Landon is rushing in to see me laying on the bed, pants in the middle of the floor. If I'd been thinking clearly, I'd have gotten up and gotten dressed before I texted Landon. To my credit, I didn't think he'd rush out here before I told him what was going on. Not only am I naked, laying in my bed spread eagle, no idea how to explain that, but my underoos are lying on the floor in the middle of the room. I pull the comforter over me before he opens the door, but as he looks around the room, it's clear Landon knows something is going on that is not the result of an equine accident. What happened? Landon asks, looking at me like he thinks I might disappear. I want to burst into tears when I think about him seeing the lube and the kid's underwear on the floor. Landon isn't stupid, but what will he think of the poppers out and the lube on the table and me looking like I'm about to sob any moment? Despite several breakdowns over the last few days, I've never been one to cry easy. Those lessons of boys don't cry and cowboy up were hard learned when I was a kid. My family thought rodeo was a fine way to make a living, and being a boy who not only liked boys but wanted to write English, I learned not to make myself a bigger target than I already was. But here I am about to cry in front of this daddy for the second time in as many days. Before I can even decide to tell him what's going on, the words are tumbling out of my mouth. I decided to sleep with my plug-in last night. When I woke up, I was feeling small. While I was feeding the horses, I thought I should go for a ride with the plug-in. I thought it would feel good to have the saddle rubbing against the plug while I rode. I thought I could be little while I was riding, I say, trying to make myself stop crying while I talk, but I can feel my heart rate speeding up. I'm far too upset to stop talking now that I've opened my mouth. I took Jed out and he's a little spooky. It was going so well until he spooked and spun around. I fell off and landed on my ass. I don't know why, but the plug went inside. It was flared. It shouldn't have gone inside, I say, trying to make sure Landon knows I wasn't playing with something not designed for anal play. I wasn't a stupid little boy who was using a toy they shouldn't have been using, and it got lost. It's okay, I'm sure you were being responsible, Landon says, coming over to the bed and running his fingers through my hair. I melt into his touch. It's been so long since someone has cared for me. My bottom hurts so badly all my defenses are gone. I can take you to the hospital here in town. I can take you to the hospital in Fort Collins, but that will take longer. I could try to fish it out. I'm guessing that's what you've been doing since you came back from your ride? Landon asks, handcuffing my cheek, letting his thumb slide back and forth as he talks. All three ideas sound like torture. Going to the hospital here will mean dealing with people who aren't the most professional. How many guys lose sex toys in their ass in Rock River? Fort Collins is over two hours away and with the pain I'm in, that sounds like torture. However, the idea of having Landon poking around in my ass sounds like a totally different and no less unpleasant form of torture. Fort Collins, I say, standing to go. When I bend over to pick up my pants, I can't hold back a whimper as the toy moves inside me. Pressing into a raw area. Oh, my sweet boy, I don't know if you're going to make it all the way to Fort Collins. The dirt road into town is going to be awful. Can I try to get it out before we go all that way? Maybe my being at a different angle will let me get it? Landon asks, stepping towards me and resting his hand on my shoulder as he talks to me. The simple act of kindness has me wanting to wrap my arms around him and get hugs so badly. It's really raw inside and out, I say, tears running down my face. Oh, my sweet boy, lay down. I'll see if I can't get it. I'll take you to the hospital if I can't, Landon says, wrapping me in a tight hug. 
Then he helps me lay down on the bed with a pillow under my hips. He rubs my back and talks to me, trying to help me calm down. You are such a brave boy. I know this hurts, but it will feel better when we get it out. I'm going to lube up my fingers and see if I can feel the toy at all, Landon says, running a hand over my back. When my breathing slows down, he spreads my cheeks. It hurts so badly, and he hasn't even entered my hole yet. I must have been too rough. Landon is so careful not to hurt me any worse than he must as he works his fingers inside. I can't believe he's taking care of me like this. Between the pain in my body and the hot flare of shame that sears me from the inside out, I can only hope this is over quickly. When his fingers enter my hole, it feels like acid is being poured on me. I want to scream, but I do my best to stay quiet as he slides his fingers deep enough to feel the toy. When I feel him hit the plug with his fingers, I can't help but whimper. Landon pulls out as soon as I make a sound. He leans over and gives me a one-armed hug. I think I can get it out, buddy, but I'm going to have to go pretty deep and then pull it out. You are already so sore, it's going to hurt. Do you want me to take you to the hospital or just get it out? Landon asks, doing his best to comfort me as he does. Just get it out. It hurts so much and the longer it's in there, the worse it's hurting. I think the stupid thing bruised me internally when I fell off Jed, I say, doing my best to stop crying and have a coherent conversation. When Landon puts his hand on my bottom again, I feel myself slip into my little headspace. Maybe it's him being so sweet and caring. Maybe it's that I was on the verge of being little all day. But I just want Landon to make it stop hurting. It's that childhood need of having daddy make everything all better. I'd almost stop crying, but when Landon presses his finger back into my hole, I go from sniffling to sobbing. It all hurts so much, and I want it to stop. The way he's taking care of me makes it hard to remember he's not my daddy. Okay, sweetheart. I have my fingers around the plug. I need you to push for me while I pull it out. It's going to hurt, but we're almost done. Can you stay still so I don't lose my grip? Landon says, his clean hand running soothing circles on my back as he talks. Just get it out. Daddy, it hurts so much. Please, Daddy, I can't take it anymore. Get it out of me, I sob, not caring how awkward it is now that I've called Landon Daddy. Calling him Daddy is a problem for future me to deal with. The pain of this stupid plug is all I can handle right this minute. When the toy finally breaches my hole, I let out a yelp of pain as the flange opens me wider. Everything hurts and I just want daddy to make it better. I was in so much pain from the toy I didn't register all the other aches and pains from falling off Jed. All done, sweetheart, Landon says, standing and walking into the bathroom. When Landon comes back, I can't even bring myself to look at him. He sits on the edge of the bed and rubs my back, saying, you were so brave. I can't believe you were so good. I know it hurts, but it's all done now. You are such a good boy. So brave. Do you want me to lie here with you for a little while, or do you want to be alone? I think you had a terrible day and maybe daddy should stay here with you for a little while, at least until you aren't hurting so bad. Dirty, it's all I can get out. I'm covered in lube and dirt from falling off Jed. It's all over my bed. Now that the toy is out, all I think about is my aches and pains and how gritty and nasty I feel. I didn't want to bring it up, but you're pretty gross. Do you want to take a shower here, or in the big, jetted bathtub in the lodge? You're welcome to use it if you can make it up there. I can go grab my truck and drive you to the lodge, where there will be a bathtub and clean sheets. Bath with daddy? I ask, now that I've started calling Landon daddy, I can't make myself stop. Did my little munchkin see the bath toys I ordered with the little items? I can help give you a bath if you want. How are you feeling? I want to make sure you don't still need a trip to the hospital. Daddy asks, running his fingers through my hair. It hurts and I'll go to the urgent care tomorrow, but I don't think I need emergency care, I say. Even pulling myself out of my little headspace that long was hard. Russell. How could I be so stupid? There's no way this rich, 
handsome daddy would want me as their boy. When he was so nice to me, I pretended he wanted me. He took care of me when I was hurt and even gave me a bath. Maybe I could have been okay with Landon caring for me and even being play partners until he found someone else, but when I see the shirt it's all too much. I feel like he's making fun of me. The shirt says daddy's cowboy and it's everything I ever wanted and never had. I'm already too attached. Rolling over and putting my back to Landon, all I want to do is cry. I'm so sore and I feel like I've gotten to glimpse heaven only to be cast out. What's the deal with these stupid shirts? Why can't I control my emotions about them? Sure, I want a daddy who loves me enough to want to put me in things that mark me as theirs, but it's a shirt and here I am ready to cry again because of them. My breath hitches, I can't help it. I'm trying to keep quiet, so Landon doesn't know how upset I am, but my shoulders are shaking. Then Landon is sitting on the bed behind me, rubbing my back and telling me what a good boy I am and kissing the top of my head. Oh, sweetheart, if it's hurting that bad, we should go to the ER. I know you don't want to go, but if you're in this much pain, there's something wrong, Landon says, rubbing my back and talking to me. He's being so kind and that makes me cry harder. Before I know it, I gasp in big gusts of air through my sobs. I'm not hurting that bad, I stutter out as Landon runs his hand over my back. It's all just too much for me. I can't take him being nice to me, but the idea of him leaving me is also terrible. If you're not hurting, what's got you so upset? Can you take a couple of deep breaths with me? Landon asks, running his fingers through my hair as he talks to me. I'm not the little anyone wants, I get out in a rush, wishing I could sink into the bed and get disappear. God, I'll have to start applying for jobs. There must be a barn in a city large enough to have a kink community that's looking for an assistant trainer. There are plenty of barns in Denver, not that I'd want to be anywhere near Landon's club. What are you talking about? I think you need to be set straight. It's been hard not to be inappropriate since I met you. And when I found out you were a little it became damn near impossible not to harass you constantly. Hell, that first day when you were nonchalantly lifting furniture, I had to leave, so you didn't know I was pitching a tent. I never dreamed you'd be a little. I love when my sub is physically larger and stronger than I am. You're more appealing to me because you're big and strong. I'm sorry you didn't know I wanted you. If you'd like me to grind my hard cock on you to make sure you understand, I'm happy to do that, Landon says, leaning over me pressing his hard cock into the middle of my back. I take way too long to say anything, and Daddy is pulling his cock away from me, leaving only his hand on my back. It's like he's offering to comfort me, even if I'm rejecting him. You don't hate that I'm hairy and fat? I ask, rolling over so I can see Daddy's face as he speaks. Silly boy, I'm telling you I don't hate that you are cuddly and pettable. The way Daddy talks about my size with words that sound like positives make it feel like it could be real. If I get up and grab something from the bathroom, are you going to be okay for a minute? Landon asks, petting my hair and looking at me like he's seeing into my soul. I'm being ridiculous, but I can't help it. Yes, Daddy. Landon extricates himself from my grasp and heads into the bathroom, talking as he goes. It's mindless chatter, but it helps me stay calm. I think you had an exceptionally shitty day, and you are crashing. I'd say it's subdrop, but I think it's more about being in pain and being little on your ride. I mean, you got hurt and then you were alone and scared and hurt and to top it off, you needed your boss to come help you. Any of those things could have made you drop, but altogether it's a recipe for disaster. I think you feel overwhelmed and it's making everything feel like too much, Daddy says, wiping my face with a cool clean cloth and kissing the top of my head. I'm going to grab you something to eat and drink, because your low blood sugar isn't helping, and then you should sleep. In the morning if you are feeling more yourself, we can talk. I'll feel better if I get some juice and some food in you and maybe some cuddles? Landon asks, putting his arm around me and squeezing me. When I hear the word drop, I realize I've had nothing to eat all day and I'm definitely dropping. I played last night and then I was sort of little most of the day and it wasn't like it was an easy and fun day of being little either. Okay daddy, can you put on a movie? 
If I have something to focus on while you're getting stuff in the other room, I'd feel safer. Sure, buddy, Landon says, turning on the TV and helping me find something to watch before he heads downstairs. He's right, and I was just overwhelmed and feeling everything more than I normally feel things. My ass hurts and today was awful, I shouldn't be hard on myself for dropping. I sign into Netflix and put on Roswell, New Mexico. It's complex enough I need to be big to follow the show. Being big gives me the clarity I need not to hyper-focus on what an idiot I was about Landon not wanting me. Poor daddy came up here five times to bring me different things. First, he brought me chocolate and juice, then he started dinner and had to check on me. Then he brought up dinner. Daddy made me homemade mac and cheese. The comfort food made me feel safe and cared about in ways I never thought I'd have. After dinner daddy came in with PJS on and got in the bed with me. Since I stopped seeing Dylan, I can count the number of times I've slept in the bed with someone when I didn't just fall asleep after sex. Lying here with a daddy who puts so much effort into showing me he cares makes me wonder if I can have this with Landon. For the first time in memory, my chest expands with a tiny fraction of hope. Russell. Last night, I really thought Landon liked me. But from the moment he realized I was humping him this morning, he's been acting like everything that happened yesterday was a giant mistake. I can see where he's coming from, yet I can't help thinking he doesn't want me. How could he want a big, fat, hairy little boy? Landon doesn't strike me as the type to use his money to get people into bed, but he's gorgeous and rich. There must be tons of little boys who want to belong to him who don't look like the poster man for a bear's weekend. Landon sits next to me on the couch and pulls me into his side as he looks over the papers. I feel my muscles relax. The only long-standing partner I ever had was Dylan, and even after the years we were together, he never understood my needs as easily as Landon did after one day. I see you like some of the less sexy parts of age play. Tell me what you want as far as rules and expectations? Landon asks, squeezing me and reminding me he genuinely wants to know what I am thinking and feeling. Well, I enjoy knowing I'm good. I have a bit of a praise kink, I say, feeling like I'm going to break with the way he's watching me. How could I be so stupid to tell him how much I love being praised? I'll do almost anything to have someone tell me I was good, and I've had it used against me in the past. Normally I mention it, but I don't talk about how much I need it. The way Landon's looking at me, I can tell he understands. You enjoy being told you're good? I have known people who had a hard time accepting praise if they didn't feel like they had earned it. Are you that kind of person, or do you like being praised for anything? Landon asks, holding me as he pulls out a notebook poised to make notes. I mean, it feels different when you have to work hard to earn the praise, but no, I'm happy to be praised for things that weren't particularly difficult. Last night when you were telling me how strong and brave I was, it meant a lot because it was so hard to let you, um, get the toy out. I'd still have loved it if you told me I was good for drinking my juice or eating all my breakfast, I say, hands fidgeting with my shirt and never meeting Landon's eyes. Well, in case you didn't know, you were a wonderful boy yesterday, and I'm not just saying that because you like hearing it. You were so brave to let me help you when we didn't know each other. I can't imagine how badly you were hurting or what went through your head when you reached out to me in such an embarrassing situation. Frankly, I'm honored you trusted me enough to make that call. Not only were you brave, but you did what you needed to do to take care of yourself and Jed and that takes so much courage. You are also showing courage by talking to me now. We don't know each other and this has to be scary to open up to me, so thank you. I'll do my best to earn your trust, Landon says hugging me while he's talking. Then he works his way down the list, making notes in his book. You mentioned being little in public as something you like. Do you like playing in places where you can be open about being little, like clubs? Or are you talking about more covert play? Landon asks, pen poised over his book. I enjoy playing in front of people at clubs where I can be free about being little. I enjoy stealth play as well. I'm not interested in doing much stealth play here. The town is so small if we got found out, everyone in town would know before we got back to the ranch. If you wanted to go into Denver or Fort Collins, I'd love to do some stealth play. Daddy is holding me as he chews on his pen. 
I can't tell if he's thinking or fantasizing. The more we go over my list, the more excited I am about playing with Daddy. When he talks about the things he likes, they are all things I'd be on board with. My imagination is running wild. I can see us having so much fun playing together. When Daddy talks about his plans for the ranch, it's exciting. Seeing Jamie and Hendrix playing in the playroom, it was clear the playroom was for more than personal play. As he talks about hosting singles events and events for established partners, I can't wait to see who'll come and explore the lifestyle at the Rocking Horse Ranch. My bottom is sore and I want to be done sitting, but it's so nice being held by Daddy. I could stay in his arms forever. Maybe I'm fidgeting or my daddy can tell I'm sore, but when I can't take it anymore daddy asks, do you need to get up? I bet you're still pretty sore. Yes, daddy, I need to get up and move around, I say, standing up, hoping daddy doesn't push taking me to the doctor. Why don't you come down to the playroom? You can help me figure out if there's anything else we need. I'll show you what I've ordered for the other side of the dungeon, daddy says, helping me stand and leading me to the playroom. Landon. Wow, I never dreamed such a shitty experience for my boy would help us find one another. Over the month since the incident with the toy, I've gotten to know my boy well. The ranch is almost ready for the grand opening. Russ has helped me with everything. He understands what will work with our traditional guests. He also gives me a new perspective on what our littles, subs, and pets need. I understand the dom, caregiver, handler side, but having him help me has made Rocking Horse Ranch so much better than it would have been otherwise. The non-little playroom is finally set up. I can't wait to do all sorts of hurt why things with Russ. With everything that's been going on Russ has been little at least for a while almost every day. Sadly because of the incident with the toy we haven't gotten to do much about it yet. When he was still in pain after a week, I forced him to go to Denver and see my doctor and it's a good thing he did. It's shocking how Russ hid his pain that first week. I knew he was hurting. I didn't know how badly. When I woke up to him sobbing in the bathroom, I told him he didn't have a choice about seeing a doctor. I'm so glad I did. While the doctor's appointment was awful for my sweet boy, knowing exactly how hurt he was allowed him to be vulnerable with me and tell me when he was hurting and needed someone to take care of him. He bruised his rectum when he landed on the toy and needed to spend three weeks not lifting anything over 25 pounds. To say my boy doesn't do well when he's not working is an understatement. It's been good to have a few weeks to get to know each other without being able to play sexually. Thank God Russ hadn't done damage because he was so determined to push through the pain. At least Russ was okay and finally able to do more around the ranch. Not only was my boy hurting, but I needed my farm hand to work, but we're still on track for our opening and he's healthy. I never wanted a little who depended on me but it's been fun to have a little who needed me. Still, thank fuck he's healthy again. The natural pool is going to be put in today, so Russ is picking up the rented backhoe. I've been delaying putting in the pool until Russ can help because I wouldn't know one end of a backhoe from another. I could have figured out how to dig a hole in an enormous field, but the way he's been talking about driving the backhoe, I couldn't bear to take that away from him. Although, when I told Soren and Malcolm I was renting a backhoe, they invited themselves up so Jamie and Hendrix could drive it. Apparently, it's every little boy's dream to play with heavy machinery. I was never that little boy, so I don't see the appeal, but if it makes my boy happy, what can I say? Russ made me promise not to tell anyone he lost a toy in his ass. I told him no one would think he was stupid when they found out how he lost the toy, but he was embarrassed, so no one knows I still haven't had anal sex with my boy. Since they don't know this is the first opportunity we've had for sex, I can't blame them for crashing my weekend, but still. Russ pulls in with the backhoe and I can see the huge goofy grin on his face. I can't help running over and kissing him. We have a couple of hours before everyone gets here. Since he started talking about using the backhoe to dig the pool and I saw how excited he was about getting to operate heavy machinery, I've wanted to do naughty things to him while we're in the backhoe's cab. Maybe I do have a thing for heavy machinery. You ready to try this thing out? I ask lips widening in a grin as he unloads everything. Yes daddy, Russ says, 
ducking his head down and looking out from under his eyes as he smiles. The look of joy on his face as he climbs into the cab of the backhoe is infectious. Russell. When I begged Daddy to make me feel better, I never dreamed how close we would grow in such a short time. For the first week after everything happened, I did my best not to let Daddy know how much pain I was in. When he found me sobbing in the middle of the night, it was such a blessing because, once again, Daddy stepped in and took charge. He made me go to the doctor. It was hard finding out I had damaged the muscles in my rectum. I hadn't told Daddy how bad it was, but he never pushed me to do more than the doctor said I should be doing. He also took care of everything so I could get better and not have to worry. There is still more pain, but it's getting better, and the doctor has finally let me do more than lay around and watch Daddy work. When I brought up the idea of the pool, Daddy listened to what I said and even let me do all the planning. It was a tremendous change from when I brought it up to previous owners, only to be ignored or ridiculed about it. I hope the pool will help draw guests to the ranch. I know Daddy is planning to have a lot of kinky events, but those few events aren't enough to sustain the ranch. The pool will help keep the guests happy kinky or not. I never got to drive heavy equipment as a child. When I started planning the pool, the fact I'd be able to drive a backhoe when I was little was something I was looking forward to. Do you want to show me how it works before everyone gets here? Daddy asks, wrapping me in a hug from behind. I can feel his cock poking my ass and I'm curious why Daddy is hard when we're talking about driving the backhoe. Yes, Daddy, I say, climbing into the cab. Daddy rented a large backhoe. I have to climb two steps to get into the cab. At least it has a glass surround so it won't be quite so windy while we're digging. Daddy follows me up through the door and climbs up behind the chair so he's able to see what I'm doing over my shoulder. There's barely enough room for Daddy to stand behind the chair in the cab as I move the excavator over to where the pool will be. When everything is positioned, I dig. I let myself slide into my little space as I work. I've spent so much time as a little around Daddy all I have to do is relax and poof, I'm little. I no longer have to think and work on being small. Daddy and I are smiling like fools. After the first couple of scoops with the backhoe Daddy seems to relax or at least stop worrying about startling me and he rests his hand on my shoulder. I rub my cheek over his hand as I dig. Maybe it's that I'm so clearly enjoying what I'm doing, or maybe Daddy is some kind of heavy equipment perv, but Daddy's stiff cock is pressed up against my back. My cock hardens just from Daddy's rubbing against me. Daddy reaches around and unzips my pants, palming my rock like cock as I steer the bucket this way and that. After the second or third stroke. I'm not even pretending to scoop dirt anymore. Eh, 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 I moan. Daddy has been playing with my cock for the past month, but there is something about being little and playing with the backhoe that has me keening already. Leaning back into Daddy as he strokes my cock, telling me, I never knew I enjoyed watching my boy work so much. But fuck if seeing you handling this machine didn't make me want to take your stiff little boy cock right in my mouth. Why is this cab so small? I can't even get my mouth on you. Shit, maybe we should rent other equipment before the ranch opens. Fuck, does my little man know how to drive a cherry picker? Fucking your ass while I look out over the whole ranch from 150 feet up. As daddy talks, I can feel him rubbing his erect cock against my back. I have to think about anything other than what we're doing to keep from coming all over myself. I'm so close, daddy, I get out as the door to the cab opens, then two things happen at once. I come all over the cab of the excavator and I connect why the door opened. And I'm staring at a very excited Hendrix and Jamie as I do. Daddy, I want to do that. I hear Jamie or Hendrix say as Daddy comes all over my back. I'm going to kill you all. Do you know how easy it will be to bury the bodies? I have an enormous machine to do the hard work. No one will know what happened to you. I hate you all. I hear Daddy say, wiggling to get out from behind me and climbing out of the cab. While Jamie and Hendrix walking up at that moment sucked, everything until that was about the hottest thing I've ever done. That includes that one time I had sex on the back of a horse. All at once, that daddy is an accomplished writer pops into my head and I can't help but think of all the crazy things we can get up to together. 
I climb out of the cab following Daddy to where Soren and Malcolm are standing with their little boys, laughing and chatting as Daddy marches towards them. No matter how blissed out I am, I can't stop thinking of ways to make them pay for interrupting us. I know at least Malcolm and Soren knew what was going on. Even if Jamie and Hendrix were so lost in their little space they didn't realize, their daddies knew. Silently, I vow to make sure I ruin at least one orgasm for both of them this weekend. Landon. Talk about coitus interruptus. Fuck my friends. I guess they didn't know we hadn't fucked each other's brains out, but despite that, to get interrupted like that was super shitty. When I look back at Russ from where my friends are standing, it's clear they could see us in the backhoe, and they still let their boys interrupt us. Russ is clenching his jaw. Glad I'm not the only one who's pissed we got interrupted. On the way to the lodge, I rub Russ's back, offering him some physical contact. It would have been nice to have been able to have the time to pull our pants off and finally plunge my cock into that ass I've been fantasizing about. It's been nice to get to know him and his little space, but I want to know him as a big as well. What have you assholes been up to while I've been away? I ask, letting my shoulder pump into Malcolm's as we walk up to the lodge. Normally I'm not one for butch displays, but I want to throttle him and I can't. I'm hoping he'll be so focused on telling me about work he won't have time to ask about all the naughty things we haven't been doing here at the ranch. How Malcolm talks about Crash, though, Let's me know he's not fooled by my sudden interest in talking about work. I should have known my best friend wouldn't be fooled into talking about work when there's something juicer to talk about. They brought up a bunch of kinky furniture I needed for the littles area and the playroom. Sadly, I'm still waiting on a few items that are being made to order. You can pay extra to get moved to the top of the list, but it still takes time to build things. Hopefully they'll be delivered by the grand opening. I don't think they will, but I can hope. As we unpack the truck, I can see Russ smiling as he interacts with my friends. Have you been talking to Jamie? I ask Russ when we're alone by the truck. I don't want to embarrass him, but I want to know. Yeah, he invited me to the online littles group, and we've been talking. It's nice to have a friend who's a little, Russ says almost bashfully. I didn't mean to make him think he wasn't allowed to make friends. I'm glad you're making friends. Jamie is sweet, and he runs all the little events for the Phoenix. He can introduce you to other littles, I say, hoping my sweet boy understands I want him to talk to people. Thank goodness we got the truck unloaded before the boys started playing with the backhoe. The moment the truck is empty, the boys are heading out to the gargantuan piece of equipment. Both Jamie and Hendrix were keen to try moving dirt. Russ stayed big, from what I could tell but I can see how desperate he is to dip into his little space and play with his friends. Malcolm and Soren look so happy watching their boys climb into the backhoe. I wonder if I look that happy when I gaze at Russ. I'm so proud of Russ for containing his enthusiasm while showing Jamie and Hendrix how to drive the backhoe. Look, Daddy, I'm digging, Jamie yells. Turning the machine too quickly and spilling dirt back into the hole they already dug. Russ laughs, and Jamie scowls, making the rest of us laugh. I wasn't making fun of you, Russ says, rubbing Jamie's back as he helps him control the machine. The backhoe has feet, so there's not much chance of it tipping over, at least not in this stage of the project. It's still a risk that one little being overexcited could tip it over, but it's unlikely. Both Russ and Jamie are clearly enjoying using the machine to dig in the dirt, so I'm not shocked when I hear Hendrix yell, I want to take a turn. Jamie, give your friend a turn, Malcolm chides, watching Jamie glare from inside the cab. Russ keeps his place as Jamie climbs down, only to be replaced by Hendrix jumping into the cab to take his turn at moving dirt. When all the littles expressed a desire to play with the backhoe, I never dreamed they'd be interested in using the machinery for more than 20 or 30 minutes. But as the afternoon drags on, the boys are eager to take turn after turn. We might get this project finished this weekend. The beauty of the natural pool is that it doesn't have to be completely smooth or have concrete poured. In a natural pool, you have two areas, a deep area you swim in and a shallow area with fish and plants. There's a plastic liner in the swimming area so you don't stir up dirt in the deep part. 
The plants and fish in the shallow area of the pool keep the water clear. As the hole gets deeper, it becomes clear someone with more skill than Jamie and Hendrix needs to take over. The boys are very enthusiastic, but they aren't good at keeping things even. Russ told me he could get everything even, so I'll let him work on that another day. I tell everyone playtime is over and herd everyone toward the lodge. Russell. I enjoyed playing with my friends and watching them drive the backhoe. They got to be little, and I didn't. It was fun being little this morning. I had to stay big all day while they got to play because they would have messed up the pool if I didn't. I hoped I'd be able to be little more, but with Jamie and Hendrix wanting to dig, I couldn't. I must have lost myself in my thoughts, because the next thing I know, Daddy is yelling at me. And the pool is far larger than we had originally planned. I guess Daddy wasn't noticing that I was going a little crazy with my digging. There'll be a few things in the morning for me to touch up, but mostly, everything's done and I'm quite sore from being in the backhoe all day. I make it out of the cab with a little help from my daddy and we walk up to the lodge. It's clear the other littles have been awake for a while and are playing in the basement. Daddy's mean and makes me go take a shower before I can go play. I rush through my bath, as daddy chides me about rushing and not getting myself clean. After I try to get out of the tub with my hair still soapy, Daddy comes in and sits with me until I'm clean. After my bath Daddy puts me in a rocking horse ranch onesie and I run down to the playroom. Eager to play with my friends. When I met Jamie, I never thought we'd become friends, but he's an easy little to talk to. Landon is planning on staying here at the ranch and not going back to Denver at least for a while. It's nice to know if he moved to Denver I'd have a friend there. Running into the playroom, I'm excited when I see my friends sitting there. When I was with Dylan, I didn't have any little friends. He didn't like to go to the clubs to hang out, so I never really got to make little friends. I run to where Hendrix and Jamie are playing and drop to my knees. My friends are playing with blocks, so I make a tower with them. Before my tower is done, I notice it smells like food, and as much as I want to play with my friends, my stomach growls. Oh, is my little man hungry? Daddy asks, ruffling my hair. Yes, Daddy, I'm starving, I say, leaning into him as I stand. After the stupid toy incident, I avoided eating for a while because it hurt so much to sit up or use the bathroom. When Daddy figured it out, I was in big trouble. Now Daddy has taken it upon himself to make sure I eat on a regular schedule. I can hear Jamie babbling about how much fun he had playing with the backhoe today. Can we play in the pool tomorrow, Daddy? Jamie asks. I know we aren't halfway done with the pool, but I don't want to burst his bubble. So, I keep my mouth shut as Daddy explains that the pool won't be completed this weekend. Maybe next time they come up to visit he'll be able to swim. It's barely April in Wyoming, so it's way too cold to swim even if it was done. There are warm afternoons now, but it still gets cold at night, and we'll probably get another snow this spring. Looking at the table, I can see Daddy made foods with Littles in mind. There are chicken nuggets and macaroni and cheese. I can't help but giggle. With all the bruising and soreness from my adventure on Jed, I haven't been able to have many little foods. Sadly, Daddy hasn't been giving me many little foods because he didn't want to upset my tummy while I was healing, so he's been spoiling me now. Smiling, I hug Daddy and find a seat at the table. I smile at Daddy as I see what he put on my plate. Jamie and Hendrix chat about what they want to do for the rest of the weekend. In the morning, I'll have to go out and do some more work with the backhoe. If I get up early and hurry, I can probably be done by the time Jamie and Hendrix are awake. Jamie and Hendrix are talking about going on a hike and riding horses again. Are you guys ready for dessert? Daddy asks, putting his hand on my shoulder before he heads into the kitchen. Not waiting for us to answer, Daddy brings out a large pan of what looks to be some kind of cobbler. You make cobbler? Hendrix asks, bouncing up and down in his seat. I keep waiting for him to jump up and run over to where Daddy is standing. He manages to stay where he is by what seems sheer force of will. I like to eat, but I never get that excited about food. Hendrix looks like he skips dessert more than he eats it, so maybe that's why he's so excited about Cobbler. 
Daddy makes us clean the table off and he even lets us use the big dishwasher to clean everything before we go to bed. Jamie said doing dishes was stupid, so we didn't play with the big dishwasher, but I thought it looked like fun. Maybe I'll play with it when he's not here. Did my little man have a good day? Daddy asks, wrapping his arms around me in his bedroom. It was very tiring and hard to be big when everyone else was little. But I had fun playing with the backhoe, I say, rocking back and forth in daddy's arms. I haven't slept in the cabin since I got hurt. At first it was because I was in so much pain, I didn't want to be alone and daddy holding me made me feel better. Now it's been a few weeks and I don't want to sleep in the cabin alone. When I look around the room, I see that I've moved in with daddy and I didn't even notice. When I first got hurt, daddy went down to the cabin and brought my clothes. Then daddy brought all my little items, but at some point daddy brought all my pictures. He covered the walls with not just my pictures but pictures of his friends from crash. I can't help but feel a little panicked at the thought that we're living together and I didn't even notice. I'm anxious until I remember I didn't ask for anything to be brought in and daddy hung the pictures, so he must want me here. This gives me a warm, swoopy feeling in my tummy, allowing me to relax in a way I didn't think possible. I take a deep breath and relax in daddy's arms. Landon. My dear sweet boy went still and seemed to panic before he calmed back down. I'm not sure what got him so nervous. I decide to let it be since he's calm now and not talking about it. Tonight's the first night he's able to do more than fool around, and suddenly the need to fuck him is all-consuming. My cock needs no encouragement to harden against my pants and I can't keep my gaze from Russ's ass. I sit down on the bed, tugging my boy with me. Did you have fun today? What about when we were in the bathroom alone? Russ blushes and wrings his hands. I can't tell whether he's ashamed or just being cute. Does my sweet boy want to finish what we were doing this morning when we got interrupted? Russ is twisting and wiggling in my arms. Yes, daddy, please. It's been so hard being good boy, Russ says, giggling and clapping. He's clearly back in his little space. I know Russell's little side is very sexual, but most of our sex has been when Russ was big. The opportunity to be sexual with Russ while he's little has me rushing to get him out of his clothes. Russ is so ticklish I take my time running my fingertips over his abs, watching him pull his shoulders up to his ears and wiggle around. I run my hand over his hairy belly, leaning in and taking a nipple in my mouth. I can hear a hitch in his breath as I run my fingers over his nipples. When I look down, I see the way his cock is tending his pants. I want to reach down and stroke his cock from base to tip, but I want to take my time with him tonight. Leaning in, I nibble at the column of his neck, enjoying the way he whimpers as I run my teeth over his neck. I'm hard as a rock, but I want to enjoy this, leaving kisses up his neck, nibbling until my mouth sucks the delicate spot behind his ear. I use my tongue to lick and suck on his earlobe. I can't help rubbing my knee, hand, palm, against his cock as I play with his ear. Daddy, please, Russ whimpers as I nibble on his neck sucking his earlobe into my mouth. Please what? I ask, taking the chance to pull back and look at him, making sure he's okay with this. His pupils are so big his brown iris is wire thin. Daddy, please, Russ whimpers again as I ruffle my palm over his cock. I don't use much pressure. Russ leans in, doing his best to push his cock into my hand, trying to get enough friction to do more than be frustrating. Stop rubbing your pee-pee on me and tell me what you want, I say knowing it'll be hard for him to calm down enough to express what he wants. Russ stops breathing as he whispers again, holding himself completely still but still not speaking. I need you to use your big boy words and tell me what you want. I say, pulling back so that I'm not touching him at all. Oh, daddy, daddy, please, Russ whimpers, ride, please, daddy ride please. Oh. My boy wants to ride my cock? I ask, leaning in and stroking his hard cock through his pajama pants. Daddy is going to let you ride his cock, I say, pushing him back so he falls on the bed. I climb on top of him so I can suck on his nipples. I nibble my way from one nipple to the other and back again. 
I can feel him grinding on my leg as I do, but I don't stop or even acknowledge what he's doing. Before he rides my cock, I want him on the verge of coming. I slide my hand down, grabbing the top of his pajama pants and yank them down so I can get to his cock. I don't bother taking them off before taking his cock in my mouth and I'm sucking him all the way down. Russ tries to buck up into my mouth but I use my arms to hold his hips so he can't move. As I work my mouth up and down daddy's cock the earthy taste is intoxicating. I put my finger in my mouth to get it wet. Normally I'd make a show of it, but I'm in too big a rush. I slide my finger into my boy's ass making sure to hit his prostate on every thrust. Russ lets out a whimper as his cock slides down my throat. Oh, God, Daddy, I can't. Oh, stop. Oh, oh no, Daddy, Russ whimpers as I pull off his cock with a pop, pulling my finger out of his ass as I do. Roll over so Daddy can lick your hole, I say, standing so Russ can roll over. My boy is so needy he spreads his legs apart so I can get better access to his hole. I take a second to get myself situated so I'm comfortable between his legs. When I'm laying between his legs, I pull his cheeks apart. If I'm honest, I've wanted to do this from the first moment I saw him. The intimacy is like nothing I've experienced before. I love being in charge, doling out his pleasure as I take mine. Once I have his ass spread, I lean in and run my tongue over his hole. The first few licks are soft. I don't want him to come until he's riding my cock. Russ is wiggling and whimpering by the time I press my tongue into his hole and even then I don't go deep. I'm only putting my tongue an inch in, not wanting to let him come yet. Pulling my tongue out of his ass, I take my two fingers and press it into his greedy hole. It only takes a few thrusts before I relax my boy enough to take a third finger. Before I have my boy ride my cock, I want to make sure he is ready. I don't think either of us would do well if we had to wait for him to heal again. I take a while fucking his ass with my fingers in slow strokes, not wanting him to come. I'm making sure to hit that spot inside so he's on the verge of release but I keep him on the desperate precipice with no relief in sight. Is my little buddy ready to ride daddy's cock? Oh god yes, please daddy, let me ride your cock. Good boy, let me get on the bed so you can ride me, I say, getting off the bed so he can make room for me to lie down. The moment I'm back on the bed and lying down, Russ is on his knees next to my hip. He's waiting like a good boy for me to let him ride my cock. He's such a needy little cock slut, I wonder if I can train him to only come on my cock. Turn so daddy can reach your hole again, I say, grabbing the lube bottle again and making sure my boy is slathered with it before putting some on my cock. We've talked about it and we're both on prep and neither of us has any other STIs. You're going to straddle daddy's hips and I'm going to line my cock up with your hole. I want you to take it at the pace that's best for you. After the toy incident, I don't want you to get hurt by rushing. Russ looks so serious as he straddles my hips. I hope he doesn't feel like I'm chastising him. Russ works the head of my cock into his hole, but he takes his time before he even tries to take more than the head. I watch as my boy works himself on my cock. He's handsome in such a masculine way. I could stare at him for hours and never get tired. I never noticed, but Russ is one of those people who sticks his tongue out of his mouth when he's concentrating on something and it's adorable. I want to say something, but I don't want to make him self-conscious about it. Russ doesn't look like he's in pain, but he takes a good minute or more before he tries to take more of my cock. I'm not huge, but I'm not small. The toy he lost was smaller than I am. It was pretty big for a toy he thought he could wear for hours. I don't think my size will be that much of an issue for him when he gets going. When Russ bottoms out, he pauses for a second before he works his way up again. For a moment I think he hurt himself with the speed of his pulling off, but almost as quickly, he's sliding back down. God, there is something about having a partner ride you that's amazing. I love getting to watch my boy's face as he rides my cock. His head is thrown back completely lost in the sensations as he bounces up and down on my cock. My hands wander, finding his nipples. His nipples are hard as I squeeze them. He's bouncing on my cock. 
The way he tosses his head back and seems to lose himself in the sensations makes me long to do so many other things with this man. Russ rolls his hips when he's seated fully on my cock. When he releases a guttural moan, I can only imagine he found his prostate. God, I bet you can come just from having your hole played with. I wonder if I can train you to only come from anal play. I can daddy. Fuckity duckity, why is that so hot? I want you to come riding my cock. Can you do that for daddy tonight? I can daddy. I'll be a good boy for you, Russ says, rolling his hips again. There's something about him in his little space, wanting to be a good boy to please me that ratchets my arousal up a notch. I'm concentrating hard not to blow my watt until I'm ready. When he's fully seated again, he stays there and rolls his hips again and again leaning back so my cock rubs his prostate. It only takes a few more rolls of his hips before Russ comes all over my belly. Using my fingers to gather up a bit of cum, I taste it. Russ whines before leaning in and kissing me before I can swallow his cum. Knowing my boy just tasted himself and my mouth pushes me over the edge. I come still buried in his ass, letting the muscle spasms of Russ's orgasm push me over the edge. I need to go grab something to clean us up before we end up glued together in the worst way possible. I just can't bring myself to get up and leave my sweet boy laying here alone. I slide my fingers through his hair and pull him to lay his head on my chest. The smell of our lovemaking permeates the room and I can feel his heartbeat slow as he comes down from his lust-induced high. Perfect, I whisper.